morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Jessica Deganzik, the Vice President of Events for the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. And welcome to Politics in the Time of Coronavirus with politics professor Dan Schnur. An important part of our events and Dan's favorite part of his uh, webinars is hearing from you. So in about 30 minutes, we are going to be taking your questions. On the right-hand side of your panel uh, is a control screen or a control panel, and there is a question section there where you can send in your questions. And I will rejoin to read those questions to Dan and try to get through as many as possible. We have three great topics from Dan today. The first, who's winning the COVID fight, vaccines or variants? The second, high drama in the voting rights debate, but not much progress. And third, Cuba, Biden, and the Florida vote. What's changed and what hasn't? Dan, thank you so much for joining us again today for what should be a very interesting conversation. I'll turn this over to you and we'll rejoin in about 30 minutes uh, for our audience questions. Thank you. Jessica, thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in about half an hour also when we do get to the audience questions. But in the meantime, as we do every week, I'm gonna take a little bit of time to walk through what I think are some of the most interesting aspects of the three topics that Jessica mentioned just a moment ago. And then, as I mentioned, as always, I'll be very eager and very excited to hear as many of your thoughts and questions as possible on those topics or others in the second half of the program. So right away, let's start with COVID. And of course, there's been a, a new, uh, there's been a new surge of COVID, and we'll get into the details of that in just a moment. But before we do, want, before we do anything else, I want to start out by asking you, Claire, if you can help me out here. What do you think about what's going on with the pandemic right now? How concerned are you about further COVID spread, as we've been seeing over the last few weeks? Would you say that you're very concerned? That you're somewhat concerned? that you're slightly concerned or that you're not at all concerned. And let's use this as a jumping off point into the broader conversation. So Claire, wow, look at that. 91% uh, of our group is either very or somewhat concerned. Only 9% say slightly or not at all. And I can't even imagine what those numbers would have looked like even a month ago had we asked. But of course, we wouldn't have asked the question a month, a month ago because like many of you, we'd begin to, begin to lull ourselves into a mindset that in fact, the, the pandemic challenge was behind us. And what we're learning now is that's obviously not the case. So very large numbers of our group who are very concerned uh, about the issue. And what I will tell you, or about the threat, and what I will tell you is you're not the only one. For those of you who don't make a habit of watching Fox News Channel at night, and I know from previous questions we've asked uh, in other gatherings of this group, that we, our, our group does tend to lean just a little bit, or more than a little bit, towards CNN and MSNBC, then Fox. But for those of you who did happen to tune into Fox News Channel last night, what you would have seen is that no other than Sean Hannity in his Fox News program said the following. Hannity said, quote, please take COVID seriously. I can't say it enough. Enough people have died. We don't need any more death. And then later in the show, Hannity came back to the issue and he said, I believe in science and clarified, I believe in the science of vaccination. So it does appear like this latest surge is catching the attention of a lot of people who are much more dismissive of the pandemic in its earlier stages. But what I'd like to do before we go any further is just go through some of the most recent numbers. Uh, in the last two weeks, the number of average new daily cases has more than doubled from, and these are national numbers, from just over 13,000 cases of COVID almost all of the Delta variant on July 4th to more than 30,000 this past Sunday. And this increase is coming, as I think most of you would suspect, as the Delta variant spreads while vaccination rates fall. 
The U.S. is now averaging about 26,000 cases a day, up 70% from the previous week, according to the CDC. Hospitalizations are up 36%, and deaths are up by 26%, to an average nationally of 211 a day. Now, these numbers are much lower than what we saw last fall and last winter, but just the same. They are much higher than they were just a few weeks ago, and this is happening almost exclusively to people who aren't vaccinated. And it's worse in places where the overall vaccination rates are very low. Now, two thirds of eligible Americans have gotten at least one dose of the COVID vaccine, and about 57% are fully vaccinated. But over 97% of the people currently hospitalized for COVID infections were unvaccinated, according to the, uh, to the CDC, and 99% of those who passed away as a result of this variant were not vaccinated. Now, geographically, there's a handful of states with extremely low vaccination rates. The states of Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Missouri, and Nevada are driving a, a plurality of the new cases. And get this, one out of every five new cases in the country comes from the state of Florida alone, according to the CDC. But this is not solely a red state phenomenon. Here in California, LA County, where I'm based, and I know many of you live as well, LA County last week has reinsta reinstated mask requirements for all indoor public spaces. And over half of our very blue state is now encouraging mask use indoors. Now, the good news, the good news is that the vaccines work, even against this new Delta variant. So the challenge becomes, how do you increase the numbers of vaccinations? Well, President Biden, as we remember, had originally set a target of vaccinating 70% of the country by July 4th, and he ended up falling just short of that. The biggest challenges that we've discussed before have been in rural and small town communities, as well as with other conservatives. But the numbers are also very low. The vaccination numbers are also very low in minority communities, among young people, and most notably, among low-income Americans. So the best way to think of it is the low-hanging fruit has been picked. And those who have not yet been vaccinated, over half say that they have no intention of doing so. The best way I've heard it put is this. The first 180 million vaccinations were much easier than the next 5 million are going to be. And by the Biden administration's own admission, privately at least, they're running out of ideas for how to get those resistors to go ahead and get vaccinated. And that raises the prospect that by the time we get to fall and schools begin again, we could still have a quarter, a quarter of American adults who are still not vaccinated. Now, Biden himself uh, has vowed what he calls a neighborhood by neighborhood vaccination approach. Um, but many federal and state officials acknowledge that none of their outreach efforts are likely to dramatically increase vaccination rates. And they don't have a lot of other options to try that they haven't so far. We're going to talk about a few of those options in just a moment. But suffice it to say that the Biden administration is now strategizing over how to manage a nation with only 68% of the population vaccinated and resigning themselves to the fact that there are going to be pockets of the country that will be subjected to periodic outbreaks while the majority of Americans move on. Now, they're not giving up, of course. They're exploring a range of options at both the national and state level. And let's talk about a few of those options. I'll be interested in hearing your thoughts. So, Claire, if we can put up our second question for the group. What do you think is the best way to move forward on COVID vaccinations? And these are all options that the Biden administration and state governments around the country are exploring. Some people have said, but there should be a requirement, a mandate, that all Americans should be required to be vaccinated. 
Others are saying that those who have not been vaccinated should receive cash incentives, which we've seen here in California. Governor Newsom has gone to great lengths uh, to offer cash rewards to those who are willing to get vaccinated, uh, as have some of his colleagues in other states and localities. Uh, some are arguing that we need a more high profile media campaign with celebrities, athletes, recognizable public figures encouraging uh, people who have not yet done so to get vaccinated. Others are saying that it's not really about celebrities, but more about key influencers in a community. And that's encouraging doctors and teachers and religious leaders to advocate more, uh, uh, more strongly. And of course, the other option is we're doing everything we can or should. And if people don't want to get vaccinated, that's unfortunate for all sorts of reasons. But there really isn't an obvious option available. So, Claire, let's see what our group thinks about these five options. Hmm. Very interesting. 40% believe, 40% of our group believes that there should be a vaccination mandate that all Americans should be required. And I will tell you that while the national poll numbers don't come anywhere near what our group has said, we are seeing an increase in those Americans who are getting increasingly and understandably frustrated, saying, I'm doing the right thing. We'd have this largely beaten if others would do it too. So it's worth, we're gonna keep an eye going forward on whether national polling numbers and national political figures begin to fall in line with what they, this group is calling for. 36% of you say that we should be pushing doctors and teachers, religious leaders, and other influencers to advocate more assiduously. And that appears to be the tack that the Biden administration is taking. They're less interested in celebrities, um, although the president did appear with a TikTok teen sensation by the name of Olivia Rodrigo last week to encourage young people to get vaccinated. But the administration seems to believe, as do you, that the key influencers listed here, the doctors, the teachers, the religious leaders, are a better path. Uh, the original interest in cash prizes uh, seems to have subsided, not just here in California, but across, across the country. And 7%, interestingly enough, of our group uh, thinks that we're doing everything we can. So very interesting numbers. And as we track the progress of the vaccine, and the variant going forward. We'll, of course, come back and talk with, uh, with you about all this again. One other point that I'd like to make on this before we move on. I feel as if conservatives and rural Americans, that minority Americans and those living in urban areas, get an immense amount of attention uh, for their resistance to being vaccinated. But for all the talk about conservatives and minorities and millennials, the one group of unvaccinated Americans where there's the best potential for progress is lower income individuals and families. And public opinion polling shows that those from lower income situations are not resisting this for philosophical reasons, but have logistical challenges that have prevented them from getting vaccinated. More than half of unvaccinated Americans live in households that make less than $50,000 annually, according to the Census Bureau. So making it easier for the working poor to get the vaccine without penalizing them, reducing their already low incomes, could have a tremendously important impact on the nation's vaccination rates. So juggling work schedules and childcare could be bigger factors than politics. A lot of workers worry about having to take off unpaid time if they come down with any vaccine side effects. And there are stories of employees receiving less favorable hours if they miss work. So maybe the thing to watch is whether more employers mandate vaccination for their own employees or provide rewards to workers who get the shot and make it clear that they will not be docked if they do have side effects from the vaccine. So here's the bottom line. Most low-income workers and most working-class Americans still want to get vaccinated. It's just not always that easy. The polling I mentioned showed that almost two-thirds of unvaccinated people who make less than $50,000 would still say they would either definitely or probably get the vaccine. 
And that's who we need to be reaching. There are some people we're never going to convince. There's others who are going to be very, very difficult. But knowing that such a large subgroup of the unvaccinated would be willing to do so if we made it easier for them logistically and financially, to me, that's the most important step to take going forward. And of course, we'll come back to this topic in the, in the future. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about voting rights as our second topic. Now, as many of you may know, President Biden last week spoke in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. And in that speech, he called for the debate, he called the debate over voting rights, quote, quote, the most significant test of our democracy since the Civil War, unquote. So that's pretty big language. But then the next day, Biden went to Capitol Hill for his first closed door session with Senate Democrats that he's had since becoming president. And what was the topic for that meeting? Well, not voting rights but infrastructure. Now, I don't intend to minimize the importance of a multi-trillion dollar infrastructure plan that Biden has fashioned to move the country toward economic recovery. And certainly a president can and should have multiple policy priorities at one time. He couldn't function otherwise. But that language that Biden used really struck me, quote, the most significant test of our democracy since the Civil War. That suggests that voting rights is a singular moral test that requires us to use every possible tool at our disposal. And aside from that one speech, Biden doesn't seem to be acting with that kind of urgency. You might think voting rights is the most important issue in the country, in which case we ought to do everything we can to address the issue. You might think it's less important, in which case we talk about it occasionally, but really don't do that much. But I do feel that there's somewhat of a disconnect here, given that very heightened language that the president is using, and then seeing a less considered, and I'd argue less strategic effort to back up those words with legislative progress. And we can certainly talk about the Republican role in this, and we'll do that in just a minute or two. But before we do, I'd love to get a sense of how important this voting rights issue is to you. Thank you, Claire. Um, we've got five options for you as usual. So how much of a priority is voting reform for you? One, is it the single most important issue in the country? Two, is it one of a very small number of top priority issues? There is one of several, one of many top uh, important issues. Fourth, yeah, I support reform, Dan, but there's a lot of other things that are more important. So it's just not that high a priority right now. Or finally, it's just not important at all. Well, let's see how we did on this one, Claire. Hmm. Look at that, very interesting. 40% of you, the very strong plurality, say it's the single most important issue in the country right now. And if you add up those top two categories, the most important issue or one of a small number of priority issues, that's 75% of you. And I would say that for those of you who prioritize the issue to that level, I would imagine that it would be easy to be somewhat disappointed that the president is using such forceful language and not backing it up with like I said, a more considered and potentially more successful legislative strategy. So the question I'd offer for us to consider is whether Biden actually does consider voting rights to be an existential matter for our democracy, like the Civil War was, or whether maybe he knows it's an important issue, but maybe not at that level. And by using such heightened language, he's simply pacifying those voices in his party, particularly progressive voters and minority voters, who do believe that voting reform does rise to that level of consequence, like 40% of you did. Look, I don't want to overstate it, but comparing a nation's policy challenge to the Civil War is really, really raising the importance of an issue. And it would logically follow that a president would spare no effort at all to move us toward wartime footing to confront this challenge. But while Biden has talked about this issue more in recent days, there's not much evidence that he or his administration 
are willing to take the necessary steps to accomplish that goal. So I think you know where this is going. What would be required to pass the current version of voting legislation through Congress? Well, the only plausible path, of course, would be suspension or elimination of the filibuster. Growing numbers of Democrats, including Biden's former boss, Barack Obama, have argued that the historic, traditional Senate rules that require 60 votes to move a bill forward should be abandoned. Biden has made it clear he doesn't share that belief, which is certainly his prerogative. But that decision does eliminate the only realistic path for passing a bill in its current form. Biden's other option, admittedly a much longer shot, would be to negotiate with Republicans uh, to try to see if there's any potential for common ground that would allow them to accomplish some of these goals, or at least some portion of them. <coughs> That raises some puzzling questions, too, about the White House approach. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Think about it. On almost every issue, Biden talks about the interest, the importance of bipartisanship on infrastructure and a whole range of other policy matters, too. But on voting rights, there's no evidence that Biden's team has made any effort to negotiate, to try to find some kind of middle ground with Republicans on voting issues, which he calls a civil war threat to democracy. Now, Joe Manchin, the Democratic senator from West Virginia, did attempt a middle to establish a middle ground earlier this spring. But frankly, Manchin didn't receive very much encouragement or support from either the White House or Senate leadership. And meanwhile, Kamala Harris, who Biden appointed as his point person on voting reform, has spent almost no time working with the Senate on voting rights deliberations. And instead, she's utilized, she said she's spent most of her time meeting with activists who are already supportive of the bill. So the question is, if voting reform is that important, why isn't it? Why isn't the president willing to make the same efforts toward bipartisanship as he has on other issues? He may come up short, but he may on infrastructure and on other matters too. And so I'll simply say, I find it curious that language like the president uses comparing the voting rights challenge to the challenge of our civil war isn't met with either a different type of negotiating strategy that could attract a small number of Republicans, or much more plausibly, why he has been so reluctant to support the filibuster, uh, to support the removal of the filibuster. If you think this is a threat to democracy, then maybe changing the Senate rules shouldn't be too big, too big a, a price to pay. Let's move on finally, let's move on to our third issue, and we're going to talk about the remarkable uh, activity we've been seeing in Cuba over the last several days. It was about 10 days ago when Cuba exploded with some of the largest and angriest protests that that island had seen since before Fidel Castro took power more than 60 years ago. Make no mistake, this is the biggest challenge to the country's communist government in decades, but it also poses a real challenge, a dilemma to the Biden administration, because Biden has previously said he wants to ease U.S. sanctions against the Cuban regime. Biden's trying to way, trying to find a way to maintain pressure on the Cuban government on one hand, while easing the embargo that has unavoidably worsened the economic plight of ordinary Cubans. And that's not an easy balancing act, even under the best of circumstances. But the changing politics in both countries, especially in the, in the United States, because of the protests, makes this even trickier. Now, the political pressures on Biden here are immense. Barack Obama won Florida 
in both of his presidential elections in 2008 and 2012. But in 20, after, but after Obama reopened relations with Cuba in 2015, that state has switched to, uh, switched to Republican, voting for Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020. Florida has not had a Democratic governor since the late 1990s. And when Democratic Senator Bill Nelson was defeated in his reelection campaign in 2018, that meant that Florida has two Republican senators for the first time since the Reconstruction in the 1870s. And to a large degree, that shift has been because of support among Cubans, among Venezuelans, and other Latin Americans who've been conflicted by some of the language they've heard from President Obama and other leading Democrats about their approach to the region versus a much stronger and often strident message that they heard from the Trump administration, from Marco Rubio, and from other Republicans in that state over the years. Now, Biden ran last year on a promise of largely restoring the more open relations with Cuba that Obama had enacted, and then were later rolled back by the Trump administration. Um, but then, as I mentioned a moment ago, Biden made a much poorer than expected showing with Latino voters in South Florida's very staunch anti-communist Cuban-American community. And Trump's approach to the region did, as I mentioned a moment ago, allow him to do much better than people, than many observers had expected. Now, many Florida Democrats are already calling on Biden to toughen sanctions, even beyond what Trump did over the last four years. But a lot of party progressives and voters from minor leaders from minority communities in particular are calling on Biden to end the blockade altogether. So this is a pretty tricky political circumstance for Biden. I guess the question for all of you, Claire, if we can put it up, is what do you think is our best option with Cuba? Number one, do you think we should lift the blockade and under, with the idea that a closer relationship would improve the human rights situation there? Second, would you impose more sanctions in order to increase pressure on Cuba to grant the types of human rights that led to so many of the protests over the last couple of weeks? Third, do you think the current level of engagement is just right? Uh, we have a limit on the number of letters we can fit in the line, so L of the L is an abbreviation for level. So third, is the current is the current level of engagement just uh, current level of engagement with Cuba right? And we shouldn't be tougher or more accommodating. We just need to be more patient. But fourth and finally, nothing we do with Cuba is going to make a difference. They're going to do what they want, regardless of how we engage. So what do we think on that? Very interesting. 54% of our group, more than half, says to lift the blockade on Cuba and that a closer relationship will improve human rights. And then smaller percentages, much smaller percentages, uh, list the other three options. And that, as I mentioned earlier, would have been Biden's path before these protests. And so it is worth taking a minute before we bring Jessica back and shift to your questions to talk a little bit about what led to this tremendous unrest in Cuba uh, recently. Because this discontent has been simmering for months. The Cuban economy shrunk by 11% in 2020. And not only have they been having difficulties in their agriculture and manufacturing sectors because of COVID, but the coronavirus, but the coronavirus all but eliminated the country's tourism industry on, on which they rely very, very heavily. As a result, there have been widespread shortages of food and electricity. Uh, Cuba has manufactured its own vaccine, not using vaccines from Russia, from China, or from other countries. And Cuba's homegrown vaccine has reached less than one third of the population Cases are continuing to rise, and the nation's hospitals are overwhelmed. And so the result was this grassroots movement that we saw last weekend because of deteriorating living conditions. And what you saw was a demand for freedom of expression, 
civil rights and an end at one party rule, though arguing both for economic recovery, but also for increased freedoms that haven't been available on that island for many, many years. And of course, the economic devastation makes uh, Cubans even more motivated to push for political uh, freedoms as well. Now, it's very unlikely that the protesters are going to be able to force Cuba's leaders to liberalize, let alone give up power. Uh, the government has a history of violent repression, and they demonstrated that again last week. Uh, since the start of the revolt, uh, the military has arrested over 200 citizens, including journalists and activists. One protester has died, and there have been videos all over the internet of how Cuba's military and police forces have been breaking into people's homes, taking them away, and acting in ways that, if, any, if, if, if nothing else, certainly heighten the calls for greater emphasis on human rights in a country that has not done that uh, within, within recent memory. Uh, the government imposed a blackout on all social media and internet messaging for several days. And Cubans have been, Cuban, the Cuban people, uh, without those internet tools, have had a much more difficult time organizing protests and publicizing the abuses I talked about. But as internet service comes back, we're getting a better and better sense of what's been going on there. Now, Biden, as I mentioned earlier, is no longer seriously considering, as near as I can tell, softening the U.S. approach after Trump. And so the 40% of you who want him to lift the big blockade, I suspect you're going to be pretty disappointed. But the unrest does appear to have injected a new sense of urgency in the Biden administration's policy review of Cuba. And that's a review that began right after he took office, but it's been on sort of the back burner. And now it's a much bigger deal. Now, some of the things they're thinking about as part of that review, even before the protests occurred, is whether to lift the U.S. designation of Cuba as a state sponsor of terrorism. And that's something that Trump did just days before leaving office. But another part of the review, and this is something we'll talk about in the weeks ahead, is Cuba's continued support for Venezuela's president, Nicolas Maduro, whose government is, of course, also under sanction from the United States. And Maduro's retained power in Venezuela with the support not only, only of his military, but thanks to Cuban allies, not to mention Russia and China and Iran. And that leads even to, into a broader set of challenges that Biden faces in the Western Hemisphere, particularly in Latin America. So Claire, maybe for our last question today, before we open up the conversation, we can, uh, we can post question number five and get some guidance from our group on what issues they'd like to see us address in the future. So the last question today is, what is Biden's greatest challenge in the Western Hemisphere? Is it Cuba? Or was last week just sort of a momentary flare up? Is it Haiti? Given the horrors that we're seeing there, given the assassination of that nation's president and the subsequent struggle for power, is it Venezuela and the continuing efforts to either remove or restrain Maduro? Is it Brazil, given the crisis they face there under Baldassaro? Uh, or finally, is it the Northern Triangle, the three Central American countries that we've talked about before that are a source of so much undocumented immigration into this country? Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So let's see our let's see our response on this, and we will take this guidance seriously going forward. That is an extraordinary number. We did talk about the Northern Triangle as a source of immigration into this country, undocumented immigration into this country, not too long ago. But 76 percent, more than three quarters of our respondents, say that's the biggest challenge in the Western Hemisphere. Cuba, Haiti, Venezuela, Brazil are all important, I think we'd all agree. But single-digit responses, very interesting. And so it's very clear that our group, at least, sees the Northern Triangle and its impact on this nation's immigration policy as the biggest challenge. So Jessica, Claire, will need to come back to that issue again in the near future. 
lots of other things we could, we could talk about as it relates to Cuba. We barely scratched the surface, but I'm a few minutes over my usual presentation time. And so we are past time to bring Jessica back on and past time to get to your questions. So Jessica, I apologize for keeping you waiting, um, but I'm eager to hear what's next. For sure. Uh, our first question, do you think the change in attitude of Fox News people will have an impact? I do think it will have an impact. Now, first of all, we should put this in context. Sean Hannity, while very popular, is only one host. And most of Fox's hosts, with only a couple of exceptions, have begun to use the kind of language that Hannity's using. Interestingly enough, on a related note, Steve Scalise, the number two most senior Republican in the House of Representatives, the House Majority Whip, so he's Scalise's number two under Kevin McCarthy, Scalise announced that he was vaccinated just last week, given the recent spread of the Delta variant. And so while it's going to be an ongoing challenge uh, to convince large numbers of conservatives to get the vaccination, media voices like Hannity's and political leaders like Scalise, I think, will have an important impact. But I do think, as I said earlier, that those working class and low income Americans who want to get vaccinated but logistically have obstacles, that needs to be where we're putting our time and energy. We have been told for 16 months that the state and county leaders are following the science. However, when it comes to masking, we are masking vaccinated citizens. How can they take that stand with any credibility? Well, there's, there's a couple of things going on here. Number one, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. There was widespread suspicion as soon as the mask mandates were listed for vaccinated individuals, that unvaccinated individuals would stop wearing masks too. And it's the opinion of most of these state and local leaders, certainly here in Los, An in Los Angeles County, and in other counties around California where they're encouraging mask use, it's their opinion that the only way to get unvaccinated individuals to wear masks is to put either a mandate or a strong encouragement on the entire population. So it's really not all that fair to those who have been vaccinated, but the authorities are running out of options for how to get those who refuse or resist the vaccination to abide by these kind of rules. The other thing to keep in mind is this, though, for those who of us who have been vaccinated, while the vaccines do provide protection against the Delta variant, the more the virus spreads, even solely in, among undocumented members of a community, the more likely it is to mutate again. And while this current Delta variant is one that has not been able to, try to, uh, to penetrate the vaccinations, there's no, there's no guarantee at all that the next round of vaccination, excuse me, that the next round of mutation would not be able to supersede the vaccinations. So it is a pain. I have to admit, I had, you know, like the idea of not having to wear a mask again. But I do recognize that even though it is frustrating, it probably is the right thing to do. And so while I'm certainly not a medical expert, my friendly advice to people who are just as frustrated as me, is like me, you can grumble about it an awful lot. But when we're done grumbling, we probably do need to put the mask on again, at least for the time being. What is the holdup with the FDA on vaccine approval? Wouldn't it be even be, would it even be legal or feasible to require vaccinations? New science is coming out daily that there are more people testing positive with various variants who've been fully vaccinated. And how many boosters are we going to need? Well. Not 97, 98, 99% of the cases of the hospitalization and the deaths are among those who have not been vaccinated. Uh, my understanding is, is that those very, very small percentage of vaccinated Americans who have contracted the disease again have had other underlying health issues that may have made them more vulnerable. But for the overwhelming majority of us, vaccination is protection, at least from the current, at least from the current variant. The question of a mask mandate is almost certainly more political than it is medical. My guess, because I have not heard the president talk about this, but my guess is that Joe Biden and the people around him 
understand that imposing a nationwide mask mandate, such as the type that 40% of our group wanted, um, would result in not just all in, all out political warfare, but cultural warfare as well. And there might come a time again, hopefully not, where that mandate is necessary. But it's fair that it's very clear that Biden would like to avoid that only under any circumstances possible. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why we have not seen it. But the poll numbers are beginning to creep up. We're hearing what I'd call mainstream voices beginning to at least raise the idea of, of mask mandate for the first time in several months. So this discussion has, has not gone away. Another aspect of this, which we'll talk about in weeks ahead, is questions of schools reopening. And Governor Newsom here in California and his administration found themselves in the middle of an absolute mess last week when they began offering conflicting guidance on whether school children would need to wear masks in the fall. The ultimate outcome is it would be left to local uh, districts and schools to make a decision for themselves whether masks for students should be mandatory or encouraged. But there was an awful lot of drama by the time before the administration finally came to that conclusion. Um, the bottom line, as I said earlier, is until the rate of vaccinations improves dramatically, even if most of us are very unlikely to catch the virus, the masks probably are the best answer, at least for the time being. And yeah, that frustrates me in a big way too. How feasible would it be to do what Macron is do going to do in France regarding the virus? If you want to go up the Eiffel Tower, you have to show proof of being vaccinated. Why not make that the mandate in the United States? Boy, very smart question that was just raised. And I do think that while, again, Biden will do what he can to avoid it, if the numbers continue to worsen, short of a mandate, restricting what someone can do without a vaccine is the next logical alternative. And I suspect you'd see that not only as it relates to tourist attractions, whether it's the Eiffel Tower or Disneyland or something else, uh, but you may in fact begin to see that in terms of more daily activities too. In other words, you can't force someone to do it, but you can severely limit the options of what they can do if they're not willing. And while again, I recognize that something that this administration would clearly prefer to avoid, my gut tells me it's a much more saleable alternative than an absolute requirement. How much say did the teachers unions have on this issue? Well, the teachers unions have immense say on this issue. And I think one of the reasons that California public schools were so slow to reopen during this just past school year, much slower than other states, um, is because of the influence that the teachers unions have over these types of decisions. Now there's an argument to be made, and I respect it, which is that you wanna be as careful as possible, both for the students and those you know, who put their health at potential risk by going to work on a daily basis. Um, but I do note that essential workers from throughout society did make extra efforts in order to work to keep our communities functioning during the worst of the shutdown. And I do believe, it, to me, it's not a coincidence that in the bluest of states, the schools reopening came slowest because, as the questioner suggested, because of the political influence of teachers' unions. You can decide for yourself whether that influence is a good or a bad thing, whether on COVID or on charter schools or, or on any other issue. But whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's a considerable thing with a considerable impact. Other than requiring certain vaccinations for public school and for outbound travel, were there other times and places with a vaccine requirement, such as for polio or smallpox? How were those handled in light of resistance to such vaccinations? Uh, there have been there have been mandates in the past, and obviously this debate we don't even have to go back uh, into the 20th century. This debate has gone on. Uh, through contemporary times as it relates uh, to more commonplace vaccinations for school children. 
and you have a whole subset of parents you know, who have resisted that and fought back against it. Those requirements are very, very hard. Um, so there's plenty of uh, there's there's plenty of precedent for this type of mandate, but where I don't think there's a precedent, at least in this context, is for the political and cultural and societal divisions that have made mask wearing and vaccines such an emblem of our political divisions. As many of you have heard me say in the past, our country has been just as deeply divided many times throughout our history, but this is the first time those divisions have split us on these types of medical and health questions, and it does limit the options that our elected leaders have in order to confront the virus more forcefully, no question. What about the low number of fire police, uh, firemen, police, and nurses who are not vaccinated? Oh. Or sorry, who are vaccinated, the low number of who are vaccinated? Well, our, uh, our law enforcement and first responders and military personnel, for that matter, tend to disproportionately come from those socioeconomic groups that have been less likely to get vaccinations. I noted that just last week, the former Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, urged President Biden to require all military personnel to get vaccinated, which is currently not the case. And Panetta argued that not only would it be of critical assistance in terms of public health and public safety, but would set an important example uh, for uh, uh, communities around the country. Just as the teachers' unions have a great deal of influence at all levels of government, so do police and firefighter unions, so do nurses' unions, and so the professional advocacy organizations that work on behalf of these individuals at the local, state, and, and often national level um, have always been very reluctant to expose their members to mandates of any type. And so, once again, while encouragement can only get us so far, while a mandate could almost certainly get us further, it would also be much, would be more than likely to lead to a very significant backlash, which may ultimately end up exacerbating our divisions. So those requirements could be imposed, but it would require uh, agreement from the unions representing each of those professions. And I don't see that coming anytime soon. And I always had one audience member who wanted me to follow up on the question about FDA approval of the vaccine. Oh, I'm sorry. The, there was a multi-part question earlier, and I <laughs> tried to answer most parts of it and missed that one. Well, Dr. Fauci has talked about this repeatedly because he's been asked frequently what's holding things up. And what Fauci makes clear is that, in fact, the approval process is proceeding with unprecedented speed. And while the, the doses that most of us have taken have been granted emergency status, there is a very careful and considered medical review process uh, before uh, uh, full approval is given. And while all of us want it yesterday, and while we feel like it's taking a long time because the emergency approval was granted so many months ago, in fact, that process is moving at a faster speed than these types of drugs normally get approved. And what Dr. Fauci and others have said is that the reason that the process does take so long, while well, even though they're, they're moving faster than normal, they're still taking appropriate care, is the last thing they wanna do is approve a pharmaceutical of any kind that they're not absolutely sure would benefit the user the way it's intended. So they're moving fast, not fast enough for many of us, but as fast as they feel that they safely can. What is the future of the Republican Party when so many states where they control are passing these draconian voting laws and their opposition to federal legislation? Okay. Well, what's, what's been interesting to watch as this voting debate has progressed is the, you know, the, the Brennan Center, which you know, named after the former Supreme Court Justice, which monitors voting rights legislation more closely than just about any other organization in the country, they point to a large number of states that have either imposed or are attempting to impose harsher voting rules and regulations, but they also point to an almost identical number of states 
that are working just as hard to try to relax those restrictions. Well, I suspect what's going to happen is, as is the case on so many other issues, that living in red and blue America will be a completely different experience for voters and, and for non-voters. If you live in a blue state, access to voting is gonna be much, much easier for you. Uh, if you live in a red state, it's gonna be much, much harder. Some people, as it were, will vote with their feet. And if this is something that's of very great importance to them, whether voter in access or voter fraud, some will simply relocate to a state or locality that reflects their, their opinion. But we're gonna end up with a lot of advocates on both sides who are gonna be very frustrated because they believe that their local and state representatives are not meeting their needs in a satisfactory way, whether those needs are for more voting access or for stronger protections uh, against voter fraud. So again, on this issue, like so many others, we will be two Americas going forward. And again, to me, it begs the question that President Biden raised last week. If this is important enough to address at a national level, then he's either going to have to consider revisiting his opinion on the filibuster or revisiting his willingness to compromise in order to attract a small number of Republican votes. Absent either of those, you'll have 20 or 25 states on each side with very dramatically different voting rules and regulations. And that's that's not a good thing. That's not a good thing for any of us. Does the mainstream of Republicans support voting rights? If so, why don't they pressure their congressmen? So if you look at public opinion polling, you show that Republican leaders are very much in line with most of their constituents on this issue. There's no question that Donald Trump's statements and conduct over the last year have intensified Republican feelings on these issues. But voter fraud is also a concern, has always been a concern, not always, but for decades has been a concern that's motivated Republicans to a much greater degree than Democrats. So if you look at public opinion polling, you see an incredible partisan split. Democrats on one hand who want more relaxed regulations, Republicans on the other, not independent of their elected leaders, but in support of them, who do want more strict uh, parameters. One exception to that, interestingly enough, is the question of voter ID and of all the various types of voting reforms that have been tested in public opinion polling that I've seen, the one with the single greatest level of voter support from Republicans and almost the same level from Democrats is requiring some type of voter identification. That's something, of course, the Democratic leadership has fought against very strongly. And we can talk in more detail in the future, if you like, about, about why that is. But one of the more interesting facets of Senator Manchin's compromise proposal on voting rights is it did require a voter ID, not necessarily a photo ID and a, a utility bill or some other proof of uh, residence was just fine, uh, but there was not uh, bipartisan support in Congress to match what we're seeing in the, uh, uh, among the broader electorate. In line with stopping our endless wars, starting with Afghanistan, shouldn't we also stop our endless sanctions, starting with Cuba? Yeah. Well, that's the fight that Biden is trying to navigate right now. And of as of two weeks ago, as of 11 days ago, he probably would have agreed very strongly with the premise of the questioner's, uh, of the questioner's preference. As I mentioned earlier, Biden had made it clear and his advisors had made it clear that he was looking for ways maybe not to remove the embargo altogether, but to restore a lot of the steps that President Obama had taken to improve relationships between the two countries that Trump later reversed. But I do believe that the strength of these protests, the violence that's occurred, and in my opinion, the very harsh overreach that the Cuban government has employed in order to suppress the unrest will make it much more difficult for Biden to move in that direction. Uh, it's one thing to talk about another nation in a historical context, as Obama did in 2015 when he talked about a half a century lack of relationship between the two nations. But when Americans are seeing in real time the government's, Cuban government's response to that unrest, uh, 
think Biden does have a much harder sell than he would have had a couple of weeks ago. And I would be very surprised if he decided to employ or to, to, to vote the political capital uh, uh, to loosening relationships. If you've noticed in the days since the unrest began, the president, has, the president Biden has been using very, very strong language, praising the protesters, warning the Cuban government. If anything, he sounds like he's moving somewhat in the other direction. And even if his long-term goal is to loosen those restrictions, it's hard to see that happening anytime soon, given the state of public opinion in this country, and given the number of members of his own party who believe that this actually presents a political opportunity for Biden to reassert his strength with voters whose families came from Cuba or Venezuela or elsewhere in Latin America uh, that moved away from him in last year's election. Can you comment on why Biden has been so outspoken about discouraging Cubans from trying to flee to the US when he's been supportive of immigrants from Latin America coming here? Is it because Cubans historically vote Republican, where immigrants from Latin and Central America tend to vote for Democrats? Well, I don't think so. And in fact, uh, I, I don't think that the motivation on Biden's part is, is, is partisan. And one of the great ironies was watching his Secretary of Homeland Security, who is of Cuban-American descent, asking Cuban-Americans not to attempt to flee to this country. But if you think about it and look back earlier this year, Biden's administration has delivered that message verbally, if not always logistically, to those looking to come from Mexico, from, Latin, from Central America, and from other parts of the globe. You may remember a month or two ago, we talked about Kamala Harris's trip to Guatemala and Mexico and talked about how much hot water she got in by saying, don't come. So the Biden administration, and it's probably time in the next few weeks to revisit the immigration issue again anyway, the Biden administration has had a very difficult line to walk because on one hand, they believe that the Trump administration's actions on immigration with legal and illegal were inhumane and unacceptable. On the other hand, they recognize that the political backlash and repercussions to an immense influx of immigration at the border would damage the overall cause of immigration reform in a, in a very considerable way. So to be fair, the Biden administration has been delivering, delivering that message about the need to stay away, at least in words. Emigrants from uh, many countries and from all over the world since taking office, even while relaxing some of the uh, standards for entry. And I'd be willing to guess that just as that language versus action disconnect at the U.S.-Mexico border is going to continue for some time. I'd be willing to guess that if Cubans decide to try to make the trip to this country as forcefully as Biden and his cabinet speak out against making that trip, that they won't be as harsh in terms of denying entry on the logistical side. So take the language seriously but also recognize that it's part of a pretty intricate balancing act that this administration is trying to pull off. Would making the vaccine a requirement for the military before FDA approval set a precedent making the military a guinea pig in the future? And that's the argument against, it's a smart question, and that's the argument against Panetta's suggestion. And it's one of many reasons, and probably the most important reason that President Biden is unlikely to act on that suggestion at least until FDA approval has been given. So, smart question, and I think it is worth offering a cautionary reminder that forcing people other than ourselves to do something that we're not required to do is somewhat dicey uh, for all sorts of reasons. Thank you. Uh, maybe one last question we can slip in here. Can you talk about McCarthy's selections for the January 6th panel? Can Pelosi block any of those choices? Well, for those of you who didn't see it, after weeks of waiting, uh, House Republican leader Kevin McCarthy just yesterday announced his five appointees uh, to join Liz Cheney 
who Pelosi had put on the January 6th commission to review the events of that day. What was interesting about McCarthy's selections is for the most part, and I emphasize for the most part, he resisted the temptation or saw the potential downside in naming some of the more strident anti-Biden pro-Trump voices from his caucus. He could have very easily put Marjorie Taylor Greene or Matt Gaetz or Lauren Bulber um, on that commission and made it much more difficult to function. And although Representative Jim Jordan, for example, is not shy on these issues, for the most part, McCarthy picked a group of relatively low-key, relatively uh, collegial and potentially cooperative members. That doesn't mean that they'll work with the Democrats on everything or even most things. But McCarthy stayed away from the firebrands. I think because of that, Pelosi is unlikely to expend any of her political capital to deny any of them a place on the committee. Remember, Pelosi already got what she wanted. She has a Republican on the January 6th commission and Liz Cheney, who she, uh, she knows is going to be very critical of Trump and Trump supporters. So unless it had been a very loud voice among those other five, I don't think Pelosi is all that worried about it. And the fact that McCarthy veered away from that option uh, left her in a situation that I don't think bothered her at all. Awesome. Well, Dan, thank you so much. And to our audience, thank you so much for all of your fantastic questions today. Um, as you know, we do rely on your support to make these programs available and free to our members and people from all across the country. Uh, we have audience members from all 50 states at this point. So if you are able to please consider going to our website and clicking on that donate button to make a donation. You can also text the word Schnur to the number in the chat. And we just uh, appreciate anything that you guys can offer to us. So. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dan. Uh, always a great discussion. And to our audience, we look forward to seeing you for our next event. Take care. Thank you so much, Jessica. And thanks to all of you for being with us today. Thanks.